or Fred Forel. Mm. And uh, I don't know if he was around when Paul Lieberman uh, joined the Alliance, uh, but uh, he is really quite an amazing character. And I've been so blessed by looking at his life. I think I'm one of the first people in about 80 years that has really tried to understand what he did. He was the president of both the Austrian Alliance and then the French Alliance when he moved to France. He was a refugee pastor in that not only was he a pastor who was made a refugee, but he spent a lot of his time ministering to refugees and helping them escape. And then after the Second World War, he was a real healer of Jewish, German and Jewish Christian relations. So his details, he's born in what's now Poland, uh, Glatz, Silesia. His parents are both Jewish. They convert to Lutheranism when he is two years old. So I don't think he had much choice in the matter. And uh, <laughs> after school, he decides to study theology and become a minister in the uh, Lutheran Protestant Church. And he's an assistant pastor. And then he becomes a, a lead pastor of a large church, 300 people in Mikkelsdorf, which is now in Poland, and uh, marries a lovely lady called Magdalena. And her testimony is on, um, it's been recorded, it's on the internet, I can give you the details. And he has two sons, Gotthold and Wolfgang. He's rising up in the ranks of the Protestant church. He becomes the director of their social services. Um, but in 1933, with the Nuremberg uh, decrees, he is dismissed because he's non-Aryan. He's a Jewish disciple, of Jewish Christian. And um, he eventually um, finds himself working in Vienna with the Swedish Israel mission. I'll come alongside that. Uh, from 1933 to 1938, he then goes, he has to flee to Paris. And then he comes to New York very, by various means and uh, spends most of the rest of his time in New York and then uh, moves to Iowa. I think that's a place in America, Joel. You, you might have heard of it. Yeah, right. So um, he goes, uh, he doesn't know what to do when he's dismissed, but he goes and visits Arnold Frank, who was the uh, German Alliance president and a very distinguished, oops, a very distinguished Hebrew Christian who lived many over 100 years old. And uh, Frank says, not long after Hitler began to persecute the Jews, F.J. Farrell, minister of a large Lutheran church in Con Breslov, came to see me in Hamburg. He said that although his bishop and he were friends, and although he had been baptized when a child, the bishop was forced to dismiss him because he was of Jewish descent. His wife and two children went to stay with her parents. He asked me what to do. And uh, a few weeks later, um, a pastor from Stockholm, Pastor Perno, was visiting Arnold Frank saying, can you find someone to go to Vienna? Where, of course, all the non-Aryan Christians and many Jews leaving Germany were trying to get out of Germany. And Vienna was the transit point to Lisbon, to Spain, to America, to Palestine, to Russia. And so there were hundreds of thousands of refugees going to Vienna, including some many thousands of non-Aryan Christians, these Jewish believers in Jesus or nominal Christians who were thrown out or excluded because they were Jewish. And so he moves to Vienna and uh, there he joins the Swedish Israel mission, the Lutheran mission. He's a supervisor of Emanuel Lichtenstein, who was the great grand, the grandson of Rabbi Isaac Lichtenstein. You might have heard of him. The Institute and Delitzianum, the main training center for Jewish ministry, was there as well. And uh, he's, he's in Vienna. He becomes the Alliance president, the first president of the Hebrew Christian Alliance in Austria. There's some 8,000 or maybe 150,000 non-Aryan Christians passing through. The, it's very difficult to get statistics. And he has 75 in his New Year's meeting at Messiah's Chapel. Um, and then his boss, Goethe Haydensquist, a Swede, is having regular meetings with Adolf Eichmann, would you believe it? And they have, they're trying to get a quota of safe 
exit visas for Jewish people and non and Jewish Christians leaving Austria. So this is disputed what was really going on. But Eichmann and Hedenquist had several meetings to negotiate safe passage for non Aryan Christians. This was before the Anschluss when Germany invaded or took over peacefully Austria and they were trying to help these people um, get out and he obtained uh, at least 3000 exit visas from Austria to other parts of Europe. Uh, and he set up a group called the Bund für Christen aus Israel, excuse my German, it's not very good, which was attached or affiliated to the International Hebrew Christian Alliance. I didn't know this, mm. but it seems that the International Alliance had lots of different almost para alliance groups to try and help and encourage Jewish people and Jewish Christians to get out of Germany and out of Europe. And so um, Forel was responsible for this to try and get Christians to show love and care for Jewish people to advise on emigration. It's a bit like the Messianic uh, Action Group, isn't it, Paul, and things like that. So, um, and even the Nehemiah Fund and the Joshua Fund. And he was doing this 80 years ago, 100 years ago almost. Uh, and this was the Swedish Israel mission, and they had a chapel in it called the Messiah Chapel. Uh, they were sort of proto messianic before they really had messianic Jews. And this was the building which was raided by the Gestapo several times. Um, they were trying to work out what was going on, uh, but it was a safe place for Jewish believers in Jesus. And um, actually, um, Pharrell thought he could stay there safely. And he says, I personally am not a pessimist. And by the way, these letters are all in the archives file for the Austrian Alliance. I don't think anybody's read them for 80 years. Mm. And they've just been stunning for me to read them. Because in February 23rd, 1938, he says, uh, I'm personally not a pessimist, though our situation will turn to the worse. I'm sure that the position of the Jews and the Hebrew Christians in Austria will become not as bad as in Germany. Well, he was wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he was prophetic, but he got it wrong here. Uh, and he thought he was going to be safe to stay. But just later, we uh, realized that um, he's got a flea and uh, he manages to get out. And the next letter in the file is uh, from uh, Poland, from, sorry, from Czechoslovakia. 19th of March, 1938. Dear Mr. Samuel, that's Harcourt Samuel, I'm in Prague now. Our friend, Mr. Smith, Reverend Smith, saved my life by warning me. He phoned and telegraphed and wrote that I should come to Prague as soon as possible and give lectures there. He was told by a friend of mine here that I'm on the blacklist of the Gestapo because I've helped so many emigrants and fought against anti-Semitism. He was a real fighter, by the way. He had very strong views. He wasn't afraid to express them. I wonder if that reminds you of any other Jewish believers in Jesus, you know. Um, but um, he manages to get out of um, Austria. He goes to Poland. He goes to Sweden. And then he ends up in Paris. Now, the Paris Alliance has actually discontinued. Naftali Rudnitsky set it up uh, probably in the early 30s. He was a scholar. He managed to escape to Sweden. So Pharrell re-establishes the French alliance in 1939. And then he works with all these refugee organizations, Christians for supporting Russian students in France, Churches Committee for Non-Aryan Christians. And he manages to support at least 350 non-Aryan Christians, giving them food, accommodation, money, visas. Uh, it's really quite amazing. He sets up Again, the Hebrew Christian Alliance in Paris. This is the constitution. They have 87 at their first meeting. And then he's receiving 70 or more visitors per week seeking help. So if we think the alliance is, is not in the business of welfare, by golly, it is. Mm. And um, it's so heartrending to read the individual cases. And I've been reading individual cases that he submitted as grant requests. And then I've been following up what happened to some of the families. And it's quite amazing the stories of the people that they managed to help. And that's enough for another book. 
But he says this, each Wednesday and Saturday, more than 70 persons come to see us. Last week, there was 82. I ought to send away 41. For the other 41, we spent 750 francs. That means 18 francs a person a week. That means two shillings. That means it is too much uh, for starving already on Wednesday, but too less for living a week till Wednesday. These people are absolutely desperate. And the money he's getting is coming from the International Alliance, from Harcourt Samuel and Jacob Peltz, raising funds in America and in England and other Christian groups. But he's really desperately trying to help these refugees. And each letter I read is a long list of people with details and asking for the Alliance to help. And uh, as I was reading, this postcard fell out of the files. I don't know if you've seen this before. Has anybody seen it before? It, it stunned me. It really moved me to tears and to prayer because this was the postcard that Pharrell sent to his supporters and others. And it shows his own understanding of Yeshua, Jesus, welcoming the wandering Jew, the refugee Jew. Um, it's a little caricatured and stereotyped for our taste today. We do different things with the graphics. But this was his way of trying to draw attention uh, to, for people who weren't really aware of what was going on. And uh, this was, he says, this was put together by a refugee friend of mine and copied by a refugee of mine and copied by another German. Both of them were Hebrew Christians. So he just threw this postcard together of Yeshua welcoming the escaping, wandering Jewish refugees. And um, I've been very powerfully struck by that. And uh, somebody needs to write a whole biography of this man, Pharrell. Uh, he really did a lot. And then he has to escape and he goes via Poland, Baltic States, Sweden, Denmark, Great Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, ends up in the USA, he speaks a lot of languages. And there he starts meeting with German Jewish refugees in New York. And he found several groups, the Christian Fellowship for Newcomers and gathers a Protestant German speaking congregation of Hebrew Christians mainly, I think. And St. Stephen, you know, Stephen the first martyr, if you like, but it, it gave him his, his um, identity that he was forthright in proclaiming the good news of the Messiah to his own people. And you see here one of the drawings of one of the members of his congregation. And uh, this member of his congregation, a man called Hertz, Hirsch, didn't feel welcome when he got in New York. And uh, you can see it's quite a dark picture. It says, um, you're welcome, we don't need you. And that's how many of the German Jewish refugees felt because they were German. And of course, America was gonna to go to war with Germany. They were Jewish and there was still anti-Semitism, as you know, and some of them were believers in Yeshua as well. And so Pharrell starts gathering these people together and he sets up a council for Jewish refugees. And these pictures were done by Jacob Karl Hirsch, who was the great grandson of Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. If you know anything about modern orthodoxy, you know that Samson Raphael Hirsch was the founder of neo-orthodoxy or modern orthodoxy or Torah in Derech Eretz, the Torah with the way of life of the people in your own country. And um, this guy, the great grandson, Carl Jacob, he becomes a believer in Yeshua through Pharrell's ministry. And uh, there was an article in Haaretz about this and uh, it quotes from his memoir where Jacob says, Carl Jacob says, when I felt the drops of water on my forehead, I knew that my life had taken on a new meaning. When Pastor Pharrell asked me how I felt, I answered, I don't think I was ever a better Jew than I am today. So he, he was discipled by Pharrell that he didn't stop being Jewish when he believed in Yeshua. So there's so much more material. He found this Christian Fellowship for Newcomers, the St. Stephen's Society. Um, and we have some of his sermons, which are 
very interesting sermons. They're quite political. They're quite prophetic. They're quite theological. They wouldn't quite fit in the um, messianic streams today. They're a bit out of the box. But for their time, they were absolutely prophetic. And um, I think there's a lot we can learn from his life and his preaching. And it's in the uh, PowerPoint for you to look at. Um, he's given actually the Great Cross of Merit by the Federal Republic of Germany, one of the highest civil honours and the, an honorary doctorate of theology from the University of Mainz because he goes backwards and forwards to Germany to help with post-war denazification, post-war reconstruction of society, trying to bring Jews and Germans together, not an easy task. Um, but he has a wonderful legacy and I'm so grateful. Now, I think the key to him was that he answered his calling. And uh, he says this about coming to America. He said, I've often wondered why the Lord led me from my mother church in Germany to this country, the USA. Now I know I am like the Macedonian man in Acts 16, 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There was a man of Macedonia standing beseeching him and saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Frederick Farrell's sermon in New York City, 1944. And I can send you some of his sermons if you like. As the war wages and Farrell has made it safely to New York, he has the same moment of clarity to help Germans rebuild their spiritually corrupted nation mm -hmm. and share Yeshua with Israel. He never forgot Germany and he always had a passion to see the Germans restored back to God as much as he wanted his people Israel restored to the Messiah. I'll pause there but uh, for me it's been a great blessing to discover something of this amazing character. Mm. Amazing story. Thank you so much. 